welcome to Advent Conversations with Good Samaritan Church in Pinellas Park, Florida. Well, thank you, uh, Jeremy and Ralph, for being on with me today. And today we are talking about Nazareth. So when Jesus and his parents come back from Egypt, they land in Nazareth. What do we know about Nazareth? Well, Naz Nazareth is... Uh was located uh, in uh, the area which, which is called Galilee in the time of Jesus, well, even before. But it was the territory of the, the uh, tribal, the tribe of Naphtali. And um, so anyway, Nazareth is located about halfway between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea. Right, uh, so kind, kind of, of the southeast of, of, of yeah. the Sea of Galilee, uh, right. Uh -huh. And it's about 60 miles, as the crow flies, north of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it was kind of like a, a country, it was a small country town, you might say, although it was near a very growing city called Sepphoris, which uh, doesn't exist today, although the ruins there are absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I read a really uh, interesting uh, reflection on that that said, you know, the Sephoris was Herod Antipas, Antipas's grand capital where he'd re built all this Greek uh, style architecture and this kind of huge palace. Um, and now it's just archaeological ruins, but it was this, you know, big place back then, whereas Nazareth was just this tiny town of maybe two to 400 people. Um, but now Nazareth is still around and Sephoris is just this, this ruin. Right, yeah. And it's interesting that the, I think the archeological digs there showed that there were pig bones, which indicated that it had a high non-Hebraic uh, group of people living there. A lot, of, a lot of Greeks or Romans living there. Right. It wasn't so much uh, Hebrew, uh, a place for Hebrews or Israelites to live. Mm -hmm. Well, do either of you remember what was the saying about Nazareth? <laughs> well, it's, I think it's, uh, there's a saying in the Gospel of John where Nathaniel and Philip have this encounter where one is trying to invite uh, the other to, to come and see Jesus. And he says, he's from Nazareth. And he says, what good can come out of Nazareth? <laughs> what good thing can come out of Nazareth? What good can come out of Nazareth? Or can anything right. good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> Any, yeah, does anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk about assumptions and judgment coming out of, yeah. Um, do you think that we say similar things about places in our own world? Oh my gosh, yes, we do it too often. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking about the time that uh, Trump uh, was talking with some of the people in, in Washington about the immigration situation, and he said some terrible things about the countries of Africa and Central America and, and uh, Haiti, mm -hmm. where he called them you know, some really a bad name. I won't say it all, you know, but it was, it was a bad name. Right. He also yeah. said something about uh, uh, Baltimore when he was talking about uh, he, something that he didn't like about, I'm one of the representatives of Baltimore, mm -hmm. uh, famous representative. I can't remember his name right now, but uh, he referred to it as rat infested and rodent and rat infested. Uh, we have terrible, it's, it's basically a, 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 a stereotype that we tend to, to, to foist on places and people that live there because it's a shorthand way of not having to think. <laughs> <laughs> I think it also, um, I can speak just from my, my uh, location with privilege is it doesn't have to be so drastic, doesn't have to be this, this uh, you know, othering of another community that is, that I would deem well beneath me. But these are snap judgments that I think a lot of us make maybe on a daily 
um, even just driving around towns or looking at things or even people. And we just make that snap judgment without wanting to admit it. That kind of like look kind of snub, snub a community or a street or things like that. I mean, I don't think it has to be so profound, but I, I, I'm guilty of it. Yeah. Well, I read an article about it, about the whole idea of stereotyping in it. And it's a way of making easy the, the, the process of thinking or not thinking, really. In other words, if you can stereotype something, you don't have to think about it and analyze it or to see how you might be related even to it. It's a, it's a stereotype. And it's a bad thing that we often fall into. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, what is significant, or why is it significant that Jesus is from Nazareth, that he's from the type of this type of place, and not say a place like Jerusalem? It's that invitation that that you know, God came into this world you know, by those humble means, and it was not dressed as this king, not of privilege. And I think then it, it opens up, it's an invitation that a lot of us can see ourselves um, in that scenario, that it's, it's not about what we have, where we're from, that we can, we can still be of worth and of value in this world. Hmm. Because, it, because God values us, that's the point, you know. God takes what's lowly and makes it into something good. Paul talks about that in his letters. He has that same idea, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God takes, takes what's, what's yeah. lowly, what's <laughs> no, yeah. no name in middle of nowhere and, and puts it front and center. Exactly. What would have been lost from the story if Jesus had been um, just born and raised uh, from birth? Um, in Nazareth, or even if they had, you know, given birth in Bethlehem and returned to Nazareth. Um, but if that had happened, instead of his parents leaving, um, giving birth to him and then living as, as refugees in Egypt and then coming back to Nazareth, what does that bring into the story? Well, I think that brings in the same idea because refugees are considered, you know, the off scourings, you might say, of, of society. They're the people that nobody really cares about. Mm -hmm. they, they don't have a stake in, in the community where they go to. And they're considered foreigners <laughs> and not welcome. I guess that's why uh, people are so much against immigration. They're afraid. Uh, well, we talk about xenophobia, being afraid of the foreigner. Mm -hmm. And people are uh, afraid of what a new, uh, an invasive person might do to their settled system. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, having to, to leave and go away and be the stranger in a strange land um, and then come back and be living in this place that was kind of right on the, the edge of all that Greek and Roman culture that was, you know, kind of infiltrating in and, and the Jewish people trying to maintain some sense of their own uh, culture and traditions and rituals. Um, and yet they'd had this experience of being welcomed in, in a foreign land. And, and I, I think that probably shaped them um, deeply. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. You know, Jesus's life from birth all the way to his death was it was like this illustration of all these scriptures that we talked about of you know welcoming the stranger loving thy neighbor and it's it's the kind of the things where like that's a true kind of mark of a leader is that i'm not going to ask you to do anything that i have not done myself so i when i ask you to welcome the stranger and, and feed the hungry and you know it's because i have been hungry i know what that feels like to go without and be searching and so I'm not telling you because I'm just, it's like a, a lay of the land to just draw this, you know, this, this ruling on you. I'm telling you from my heart that it hurts to be the oppressed and it hurts to be marginalized. And that's where I'm coming from when I ask you and tell you to do these things. 
That's a good point, Jeremy, and it sort of uh, is illustrative of Matthew 25, that famous passage where Jesus talks about how, you know, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Uh, I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you gave me to eat something to eat. Mm -hmm. He illustrates it in his own life. It's a good point. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> Nazareth is this tiny little place. And I, I think about how, whether it's a, a small church or a small town, um, we tend to, <laughs> in, in those smaller communities, um, the the tendency is to become navel gazers and to <laughs> be kind of living in a little bubble. And I think it's really important that, you know, Mary and Joseph and, and the Christ child, that they make this journey away and then come back so that even though um, Jesus is this small town kid, um, he's got a bigger, bigger vision than that. Yeah. What will happen in Nazareth in Jesus later in Jesus' ministry? Well, there, there are two uh, reports about when he comes back to his hometown. One is in Luke and one is in Matthew. And Luke is probably the stronger of the two because it gives a great lengthy description of how Jesus goes to the synagogue and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, Isaiah 61, which talks about uh, the promise to, you know, God uh, healing the, the sick, uh, giving sight to the blind, opening the ears of the deaf and so on. And then Jesus reads this passage and he, he's bold enough to say this has been fulfilled in your hearing today. And the people, they first get really, you know, surprised and then they get angry. <laughs> <laughs> You know, they say, well, who is this? Son? You know, isn't he the carpenter's son, you know? And yet he, how can he be saying all these things and saying he, he is now the fulfillment of this passage? And they get so angry, they want to kill him. And he has to escape. I don't know how he does it, but he manages to escape and, and get away from him. But that was a very threatening event for Jesus. Right, and, and Jesus... Um, I think somewhere in their remarks, you know, a prophet's never wel welcomed or re received well in their, their hometown. Um, but yeah, he has to flee for his life. Um, he stands up and, and, you know, reads that part of Isaiah. I've come to proclaim good news to the poor and release to the captives and all that. And then, um, you know, it gets yeah. run out of town. <laughs> <basically>. <laughs> you would think they'd that he would think that they would be glad to hear all this, you know, but they're not. <laughs> That's true. I think in, in all modern contexts too. I mean, you, you talk to um, celebrities or people, you know, who've struggled in these small hometowns and as they get their start, they're not backed by their little community because kind of the same thing is like, well, how, what makes you so special? I mean, I grew up with you. I, you know, so and so I babysat you and changed your diaper. You're not special. All these yeah. things. Maybe there's jealousy. Maybe there's like, you know, why, why you not me? Um, until you leave, until you build that following, and until other, there's that distance, sometimes then your hometown then will claim you <laughs> once everyone else. <laughs> you get a big enough reputation. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, and I think about how many. Um, you know, people that felt called to yeah, certain careers, maybe women who felt called to careers that had traditionally been male careers or um, LGBT folks who just feel called to live as themselves um, more fully as themselves or, um, you know, people who were, were marrying interracially before um, that was widely accepted. And, and oftentimes <laughs> it is in your own hometown and your own family sometimes that you're the least accepted. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, Jesus has this <laughs> um, terrible experience of, of the community that raised him, that knows him the best, this, this small community where everyone knows each other, um, rejecting him, yeah. not, not understanding who he is and what he's about and what he's called to. Well, what are some signs of hope we are seeing out of uh, the Nazareth places in our own world. 
That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, signs of hope out of places that we think are contemptible, basically, is what you're asking. Oh, I don't places know. That are, or just, that are marginalized or something. That are marginalized. Yeah, let's Yeah, see. right. Um, that, that are on the yeah. margin. Well, the time that Carter was elected president, that was when everybody was, that was out of the blue. People didn't think somebody from Georgia would be elected president, but that's been years ago. Uh, you think about that. Uh, One of the places I was thinking is, um, you know, the, the Parkland shooting and, and then watching these students from that school become these incredible uh, outspoken advocates, yes. um, you know, out of out of tragedy, out of kind of yeah, yeah. young people acting so so adult like that was wonderful, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I think the the beauty of technology now, being able to kind of get more access mm -hmm. to these stories and the people that are in these communities. Mm -hmm. um, to lift those voices up. I'm, I mean, even just since the pandemic, because I'm getting all of this only from internet and TV, that there are these stories of mostly younger generations of sharing their stories of, you know, triumph over struggle or where they are. That it, it's that being able to hear, hear from them, mm -hmm. um, that it, to me, it's, it's, it's opening up those communities. And I, I mean, we saw that this summer um, with the unfortunate, you know, unrest and with the, the brutal killing of George Floyd, but through that community, the voices that rose up and the people who stood out and marched and protest and were, you know, it, it meant so much that we had to do something. And it, it was truly, you know, uh, community led. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. You know, I think there's a running narrative even as I think about our, our FAST, our Justice Coalition ministry. Um, I think there's a running narrative even here in this area about South St. Pete and some of the failing schools and can anything good <laughs> um, come out of these places. Um, and yet we do see wonderful, beautiful stories coming uh, out of even some of the most marginalized places in our community, out of some of those food deserts down in South St. Pete. Um, I, I hear it all the time in our, our fast meetings, you know, just talking to the people that are at the table with me, um, you know, members of other, <laughs> other churches, other communities, and, and just the beautiful things that are happening, um, even in those places in our own community that we kind of write off um, you know, and on the other end of that, I think <laughs> there's a lot of people, you know, especially as like we put out on our church marquee, um, signs about racism or, or different things, um, that are just shocked. I've, I've, I've received so many comments, you know, as, as those things kind of went nationwide, people saying, I didn't know anything like that could come out of Florida or <laughs> much less out of Pinellas <laughs> Park, which used to be the very, very, you know, white part of town, um, you know, I didn't know that kind of message could come out of a place like that. That's good to hear. <laughs> well, thank you both for uh, having this wonderful conversation about Nazareth. Thank you for joining us for Advent Conversations as we continue on the journey of this season.